Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Belloni. I'm the director of the International Queer and Migrant Film Festival Amsterdam. And it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you at the opening day of the festival, which is the M annual Amsterdam-based film festival for queer and migrant film. The festival this year will take place in a hybrid form. So with on-site screenings in cinemas and performances as well, and online screenings and talks. And today is the very first day of the festival as well. The first online talk in a series of four, which will happen from today until some Sunday onwards. And in today's talk, we will address homonationalism in the European perspective. And we will zoom in on how homonationalism is used as an instrument for exclusion and homophobia. Therefore, we invited several guests and I will introduce the guests to you briefly. Um, Filmmaker Hakim Atoui from Paris and sociologist Dino Suhonic from Amsterdam will reflect on homonationalism in Western Europe by analyzing the film La Première Marche, which was the opening film today in our festival. And the third guest of today is Amnesty International Hungary director David Vick, and he will reflect on the current situation in Hungary and whether the EU influences or dictates human rights issues. So this is the first day we are conducting these uh, talks through StreamYard. It's a new uh, platform for us. So hopefully everything wor uh, will work out well. Um, through Facebook and through um, YouTube, you're following the debate and um, you can actually leave comments and questions which will be addressed in the, uh, the final 15 minutes of this talk. So first of all, I would like to um, give the floor to Dino Suhonic and please Dino uh, introduce yourself briefly. Yes yeah as you said I'm Dino Suhonic I'm the director of uh, Maru Foundation which is a queer Muslim foundation uh, in the Netherlands we call ourselves also international platform for queer Muslims and I we are almost we exist more than eight years and both within my work for Maruf uh, and in my academic research, I'm uh, pretty much um, now almost obsessed with this subject. Thank you, Dino. Um, and then Hakim, um, your filmmaker, and you're actually um, debuted uh, with this film. It's your first film, and it was immediately the opening film of our festival. So congratulations and. Thank you so much for allowing us to uh, to screening the film. Um, Thank could you. Could you say a few words about yourself and about your film? Just a brief introduction, please. Sure. So my name is Akim. I'm from Paris right now, and I'm really happy to be chatting with you tonight. Um, yes, La Première Marche is my first documentary. Uh, I guess I'll have time later to tell you how I more or less randomly ra ran into these 20-year-old uh, activists who uh, wanted to start the first ever pride in the French suburbs and um, I loved the idea right away and I thought it would be a shame not to follow them and try to understand who they are and what they are fighting for and why it is different, why their fight is different from the Parisian pride for instance. So that was the goal of the documentary. Thank you Hakim and then uh David, a short uh, word of introduction, please. Hi, um, I'm also very happy that I can be here and congratulations to, uh, to Hakim, to his uh, wonderful film and also uh, Dino, your uh, amazing work. And um, I'm very glad that you're having this conversation. Um, it's really a privilege to be with you uh, today. I'm the director of Amnesty International in Hungary, uh, working on different fields of human rights. But uh, before that, I was actually with Budapest Pride. That's, uh, that's an LGBTQ organization in Hungary. So uh, I'm a member of the community and also involved in the work of the community as an activist very well. So I'm very happy to um, give an Eastern European tone or uh, aspect for this conversation. Thank you all for um, the introductions to yourself. Um, so IQMF is a festival in Amsterdam and Apart from screening films, we all always um, organize panel talks uh, about films, but also about subjects related to uh, to the films. And normally we try to bring uh, uh, together a panel with people with different perspectives. So 
in this case, we wanted to bring uh, Hakim with, obviously he's the filmmaker from a more artistic approach, Dino Sihonic with the uh, academic approach and David with the um, perspective from uh, the human rights uh, approach actually. Um, and obviously uh, we realized that not everyone who's attending this conversation at the moment has seen the film. So we would like to give you a brief introduction to the film by showing the trailer. Du coup, l'idée, c'est de faire une marche des, des fiertés. Le but, c'est de faire euh, vraiment une marche revendicative et politique. C'est la thématique de l'intersectionnalité, c'est quand on cumule des discriminations et qu'on se retrouve piégé dans une espèce de sac de nœuds social qui fait qu'on arrive à se représenter nulle part. Ça, ça a donné, ça a donné, c'est chaud. Euh, il me demande si c'est pas trop dangereux à samedi dans, 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 dans le quito. Quand on est homosexuel en banlieue populaire, on est aussi victime des stigmates de la banlieue. Ah oh bah tiens, t'es canon toi avec tes petits cheveux bouclés et ta petite peau caramel. Et je pense qu'il faut parler en fait, il faut, il, faut, il faut détruire les tabous autour de la sexualité. Ce que je veux dire c'est que ça s'encule aussi dans le 93. Hein. <rire> voilà. Il faut aussi avoir une stratégie médiatique, c'est ça fait. le truc. Ah, tu vois, on tombe sur des hommes pas partout. Hein. Nous fêtons un anniversaire, 50 ans de lutte pour nos droits. Nous portons le flambeau des émeutes de Stonewall. Regarde-moi ça, je vois pas la En 58 ans, je n'ai jamais vu une marche d'une telle ampleur. Vous êtes tous genre dyslexiques dans cet assaut Ça se passe comment en Mais fait euh... Public, ça s'écrit avec QE et voir, ça s'écrit avec un E. Vous avez fait vos CP dans des stations de service <rire> Wow. Um, so, thank, uh, Hakim, congratulations with the film. It's a remarkable um, uh, achievement, I think, for uh, someone who made his first film. So, congratulations. Um, thank you so much. What we actually told you. you, you was, sorry, yeah. sorry? No, I was saying, to be honest, we were two of us. I have a co director on the movie. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 Who couldn't be here for the talk today? No, he couldn't. He's, he's filming something else because we did we, we shot last year and we spent basically the last few months and weeks trying to show the movie in different many places. So now he needed to go back to work at some point. <laughs> yeah. So how did it go uh, after the, the premiere of the film? Were you able to, to showcase the film in France in, uh, in real life in cinemas? Well, what happened is that um, actually when we did the movie, we uh we had no budget nothing at all so we just shot it we edited the movie and we didn't we had no idea where to show it actually and how to show it so uh we sent it to um, a french lgbtq festival uh last year and it got selected there so we showed uh which was some sort of uh, work in process uh edit and then uh, a distributor came to us and said well we believe in it and we think it should go to cinemas next year. So at first it was supposed to come out this June, this past June, 2020, at the same time as the second uh, Pride that these students were organizing for the second year in a row. But then obviously COVID happened. So it got postponed to October and we we're fortunate enough to have uh, cinemas opened again in, in France for a few weeks. So our movie came out um, and was in cinemas for, 10 days before it closed again. <laughs> so so yes, we're really we lucky to be sure. to be yeah to be able to screen the film here in Amsterdam. So thank you again for it. Could you, could you reflect a bit on the film itself? So you follow the initiative of four students who are um, organizing an alternative uh, pride parade in Paris. Exactly. Um, yeah, please um, elaborate on it. Saint Denis is actually really paradoxical because it's so so close to Paris. Um, it's really next door and at the same time in terms of uh, population and, and money invested in that uh, city, in that area, it's, 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 it's a disaster. And so um, we ran into these students whose idea was to say um, we are not like the people who live in Paris. We don't have the same daily life, we don't have the same 
amount of money. We don't have the same experience. We don't have the same ethnical background. So our experience as uh, gay, as lesbian, as transgender people from these suburbs is not the same as the Parisian one. So actually we cannot go, uh, we cannot take the train 20 minutes, go to Paris and be proud there. It doesn't really make sense. We need to be proud in our own streets and it had never been done before. So this is why they thought that their struggle was different from the others, because there's um, actually the basis of their fight is the concept of intersectionality. I don't know if, if you're familiar with it. I was not really familiar with this concept before meeting them. So it's basically uh, being at the intersection of different um, um, stigma and discrimination. So for them, they are both seen as um, migrants and seen as LGBTQ people. And so they are discriminated in these two ways. And so that's why for them, they, they, their daily struggle is not the same as the struggle of a, of a white Parisian LGBTQ person. And so since the struggle is different, then the fight itself is different and uh, what they um, ask for is different. Yeah. And to connect to the subject of today, uh, hom homo nationalism, um, what happens is that they feel that um, there are there's one uh, particular political party in France uh, that is the far right that is called uh, Rassemblement National, and basically um, on a daily basis they have they don't really care about the LGBTQ LGBTQ question. They only care about it, or at least they pretend to care about it, when it's to target the Muslim community and to say, hey guys, if you are gay, if you're a lesbian, if you're transgender, if you're queer, well, there's someone who doesn't really like you and there's someone who might be danger for you and that person is the migrant next door. So join us in fighting them out. And for the people that we followed in our documentary, it's unbearable because um, they want people to be together and not people to be against each other. And they know that they are just being used, actually, that their queerness is being used for political reasons. And that deep down, these uh, politicians don't actually care about them and their struggle. For instance, most of the people from the far right, or I would say even 100%, voted against um, same-sex marriage in France seven years ago, and now they are pretending to defend the LGBTQ question uh, when it comes to um, actually fighting migrants. Thank you. Um, Dino, um, Hakim touched upon the issue of intersectionality and also about um, uh, right-wing or far-right-wing political parties hijacking the struggles of queer people in order to um, to actually use or miss uh, abuse their struggles for their own political gains. Um, you did quite some um, research in the Netherlands on homo nationalism. Do you recognize this uh, this uh, dynamics? Actually, what was described by Hakim? Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, we, in the literature, you can even call Netherlands as the beacon of of homo nationalism um, we uh, the, the rhetoric that is being used in france um, in germany denmark sweden um, norway uk us um, started actually pretty much in the netherlands um, and the, most of the research or most of the analysis um, go back to for example the killing of uh, theo van gogh the um, the film director um, um, 9 11 or um, uh, uh, the post uh, 1989 multicultural debates. Uh, but we can even trace back the, the homo nationalism or, or homo nationalist rhetorics um, back to 1979 after the Iranian revolution, when suddenly there was a rise in news articles covering the. Um, uh, anti-gay violence in um, post um, Iranian post-revolution Iran, uh, which which was interesting to see because si simultaneously in the Netherlands, um, a lot of people were still struggling with the idea of gay emancipation. Um, that was in the midst of AIDS crisis as well. 
there was so much stigma going on. Um, a lot of uh, social unrest, resistance from the you know homophobic parts of the society, um, uh, which made it even more confusing that you know there was suddenly such a focus on not only Iran but other Muslim countries as well. Uh, why at the same time we don't have um, you know the capacity to analyze our own situation. And I think that's the soundtrack of um, nowadays as well. Um, and that's the, the I think one of the core messages of uh, homo nationalist theorizing is that um, you ignore the homophobia at home while projecting it on the people living outside of the country, or indeed people with migrant backgrounds. Um, and I have to say, I've pretty much focused more on how Muslims are being labeled. And my research was about the framing of Muslim politicians based on these homo nationalist discourses. So I was looking at how Muslim politicians could never gain complete um, political um, development because they are Muslim. That's why they are homophobic. That's why they don't belong to us. So that's uh, in the Netherlands. I think it's it's an interesting case. Uh, I lo also love the French case in the sense like it's an interesting case. Um, but in the in the French case, I think more than in the Dutch case, you can see that the um, um, secularism or discussions on secularism uh, also play a role. And I love the part of the movie. I, I hope I can. I'm allowed to say that. But that in a radio interview. Uh, with um, uh, with that white, I don't know if he, he was gay, but white um, uh, man, French man, who was um, also giving some answers. And he said, you know, not Islam in particular, but all religions are problematic. So I think that part um, is often ignored because homo-nationalism has also to do a lot with nationalism itself. But in French case, and for in, in certain also in the Dutch case, the our relationship with religion also plays a role but there is a difference when a um, fundamentalist from the let's say christian or or jewish circles are not accepting um uh, gays um there is a different treatment you know you treat them like you know they are still part of us but when it comes to people with migrant background we do still think that you know this is yet another reason why they don't belong, belong in this country Thank you for presenting the case in the Netherlands, Dino. Um, um, so, David, does it sound familiar for you, the, 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 um, the cases which were presented by Hakim and Dino? Is it the same in Hungary or is it, um, is it different? Yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting question as you uh, as you pose it, and thank you for your insights, Dino and Hakim. Uh, both were very, very exciting. It's relevant to, uh, to the Hungarian ex uh, experience to a sense that uh, there is, in fact, a government narrative um, against um, non-white parts of the population or even Muslims or, or, or migrants um, um, in or around Hungary that, that is homophobic, uh, sorry, that is racist and xenophobic, but uh, it, is, it is not really there uh, for the purpose to gain um, the support of uh, voters who would stand up for LGBTQ rights. And, uh, and the pattern is not really with regards to uh, the queer community, uh, actually. But the argument that um, leading politicians in Hungary have been um, making recently um, is around the far right and the governing majority in, in Hungary, which is a conservative right wing um, um, party and, uh, and majority, protecting the rights of the Jewish population against Muslims who would otherwise be invading to Hungary and would take away um, um, the, the rights of the Jewish community. The, the pattern is very similar, but the group of the population, which is allegedly protected by the government, is, uh, is, is rather the Jewish community. It, nevertheless, there are anti-Semitic campaigns uh, linked to the governing party as well. So it's a two-sided sword, so to say. But from a very cynical point of view, you can observe this, that the Jewish community is kind of used in this play uh, for a political um, um, purpose. So I would say the pattern is there, but not with regards to the LGBT community. In fact, if I think of how leading parties in Hungary, including the governing majority, 
the government majority is dealing with LGBT uh, people recently. It's rather a form of othering. It's rather in a form of uh, saying that we, the government, are the Hungarian nation and the LGBT mm. community is not the part of it. So there is an increasing tendency of, of, um, of kind of excluding um, the LGBT community from the, the, the Hungarian nation. And a very recent uh, step towards this is, is a series of constitutional amendments uh, that would, at the level of the constitution, uh, kind of um, declare transphobic and homophobic uh, messages in a form of the highest in, in form of the highest legal regulations, which is uh, which is very worrying. And with which argument is the Hungarian government uh, trying to exclude the LGBT um, communities by by claiming that they, that they don't um, embrace the or that they don't fit into the uh, family value system? So uh, look, the the recent constitutional amendment reads as follows: the mother is female, the father is male. And this is a provision that should be put into the constitution um, according to the governing majority in the, in the, in the parliament. Um, obviously there is a narration um, against rainbow families or LGBTQ uh, people who uh, want to adopt children or raise, uh, raise their children, but there is many more. Uh, recently, a couple of months ago, the parliament adopted changes that bans legal gender recognition for transgender people, which is also a serious problem in the form of uh, an exclusion. And the argument here is that gay or lesbian couples who want to marry, they are threatening the traditional Hungarian marriage, and I quote the prime minister here, that existed for over a thousand years, and now there are these LGBTQ couples who are threatening our Hungarian values that have been there for forever. So we as a government, we have to protect them. Oftentimes it's even more serious than that. Um, and and, 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 and I, I would say probably Eastern European um, queer communities would experience a different type of homophobia than those in, um, in, in Western, Western Europe or, or at least France or, or, um, or the white populations in, in Western Europe, um, in, in the Netherlands and, and France. Whereby, uh, whereby in, in Hungary sometimes there is a distinction from um, from leading parties that saying that there are good queers and bad queers. Mm -hmm. The good queers are the ones who are in their homes, staying silent. They could be tolerated by the majority, and there are the so-called bad queers who are um, who are fighting for political purposes, recognition and acceptance in society. And that is something that the governing majority cannot really uh, stand. And this oftentimes results in portraying these bad queers as those undermining national interest, serving foreign values, oftentimes even called as terrorists, um, undermining state security. So they are definitely the enemy of the state. There's another film which we screen in our festival, which is called the um, March for Dignity, which is happening in um, in Tbilisi, Georgia, and and it's actually documenting the first uh, Pride Parade in Tbilisi. And there's a lot of people, uh, bystanders in the street, and they are asked for comments about this Pride Parade. And then um, a common argument actually is from bystanders was, it's okay if people are queer or LGBT in their homes, but don't try to don't show it in the uh, public domain. And what you doc documented, Hakim, with the film is, is especially uh, an initiative of these young people uh, claiming their um, position in a public domain by organizing this uh, pride parade in the uh, underprivileged um, neighborhood outside of Paris. How did you actually uh, get in touch with these uh, pr protagonists and how did you get access to these uh, to them to follow them for uh, for your film? Um, actually, I had produced a short film, um, a fiction that was already around the question of um, being queer in the northern suburbs of Paris. And my friend who was director of that movie, uh, short, actually lives in Saint-Denis. And he was an activist in that organization that we followed. And uh, as probably David knows, um, life in an organization is sometimes really hard. And there's ego and disagreements and fights. 
And so at first, uh, my friend Simon was my way in uh, this group of um, young people. And actually, the, uh, the deal that we had set was that I would follow him plus the others through the organization of this, of this march. But then after a few weeks of filming, he actually left the group. And so we ended up with these four people that we didn't really know that much that we were discovering as we were filming. Um, and so we sat down with them and we asked them, do you still accept us? Do you still accept that we will follow you, that we will come to your bedroom and, and, and at, at your parents' apartment and follow what you do every day? And actually, I think that they were... They're so young, they're, they were 20 when we filmed it, and now they are almost 22. And now when we screen the movie and we try to have them as much as possible, they have already changed actually so much within these two years. And also thanks to organizing this Pride, they are now, I'd say like louder than, than ever. But um, I think that they were really shy. They were kind of scared of us also because they, for us, the, um, also the image, the bad image of the neighborhoods is due to how um, the press has shown the neighborhoods mm. for years, for decades, how um, also documentaries have portrayed um, the migrant communities in France. And so when we showed up, they didn't really know who we were and they, they were kind of scared of the way we would edit the movie, of what we would also find out there that maybe you would see some violence that they didn't want us to see. But to be quite honest, a lot of people tell us that uh, there is no violence in our documentary and that it seemed quite easy for them to organize this pride, this march. And actually it was the case. We didn't hide any um, argument or any really violent situation from, from the viewer. We really showed it the way we perceived it and the way we lived it uh, with them. Um, so. And also my co-director and I, it was just like the two of us with this tiny camera that we bought uh, that was like uh, on sale. So um, we, were, we were not representing much more than ourselves because I think that if we had showed up with, for instance, a TV channel backing our project, I think that they would have been really scared saying, okay, you come from this TV channel. This is the TV channel that has showed that documentary that, that damaged so much our image. Um, so we were just, yeah, the, the two of us and they were really close to us. Um, there were 20, I was 26 when we shot. So there's also this age difference. Uh, we were kind of close actually. And we spent a lot of time um, laughing with them, having drinks with them. We didn't want to do it too much because we also wanted to keep some sort of distance and to be able not to create a documentary that would be um, some sort of commercial for them. We also wanted to have our own um, balance. Um, but yeah, it, really it, it took time and we were kind of afraid of the way they would perceive the documentary because a documentary is 70 minutes and they spent a year of their lives doing it 24 seven. So obviously there are moments that for them were really important because they cared a lot about specific moments that we didn't really perceive and the other way around, sometimes we kept some really random, for them, random and normal scenes, daily moments. But for them, it was important to keep them because it would also show that it's not just a group of random people who did this, um, this, this uh, pride. It's also because they are really close friends and that they really do love each other. And so we wanted to show this friendship and the way they tease each other and the way they laugh with each other. And sometimes they were surprised to see those um, like daily life moments. Um, but for us, the main thing was that we wanted them to, 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 um, to be true to them. And for now, they say that that's how they feel. <laughs> so we're happy, we're happy with that. Um, what else can I yeah. say? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you depicted the, the protagonist in a very joyous way. And when I watched the film, and I watched it uh, several times, actually, I was wondering um, how was the whole process for them organizing this parade? Because they, they must have faced also difficulties or struggles or obstacles. But in the film, it was quite... They seemed to have a lot of fun also, actually. 
Yeah, they actually had a lot of fun doing it. Um, again, I think because um, they're 20 and they're really good friends. So I think that it was um, easy for them. And it, it's also because it was the first. So they didn't really have a lot of pressure because uh, they didn't really know what to expect. For instance, they spent the last 12 months organizing the second one, and it was so much more pressure. Um, many more people joined the group. Um, now they have um, funding problems too. So I think that the second one was much more difficult because now people know that they exist. They know that they are here, and they know that they are fighting for this question in Saint-Denis. So, um, for instance, when we show the movie, um, most of the times, uh, the um, associations inviting us to screen the movie in other parts of France are the organizations that would also organize the local prides. And they always ask us questions like, but for the, um, uh, for the um, slogan, uh, how to say that? Slogan of, of, of the march, it only took them like half an hour and it was like the day right before the march. That's impossible. It takes us months and we have like, 10 meetings and we have a Google doc and, and a doodle. And we're like, no, they just did it for half an hour. But this year it was much more difficult. So the second pride for them is, is harder. They really took it as, a, as a, a group project, really a group project. And for them, it was, they were sure that they would do this pride, even if they had been four in the end or 10 or 20, they would have been happy actually, I think. Because for them, what was really important was also to show that they could do it without any violence. Yeah. I think they were, they were really scared of violence on the D-Day, that people would show up, try to beat them up or whatever, or what, or, or what we think is the worst that can happen there. Um, they didn't want this documentary and their march to be another example of how brutal and violent sometimes these also places can be and are pictured as. And I think that they were so relieved to show that, yes, it's possible to do it and it's possible to do it without any sort of violence. Thank you. Um, the first questions came in. And before I'll um, continue with these questions, I have a question for Dino. <clears throat> We've known each other for uh, quite a while now. And um, in Amsterdam, there have always also been um, like-minded uh, initiatives with the Moroccan boat and the Turkish boat in the Amsterdam Canal Pate. Obviously, different context and different um, setting than um, what Hakim depicted in the film La Première Marche. But I wanted to know from your side, do you think that this kind of initiatives, like um, what we saw in the film or the, the ones which I mentioned in Amsterdam, do they actually... Um, help the, the cause uh, do they uh, is it counterproductive or what do you think you that, that's a that's a <clears throat> difficult question and and I expressed once years before that you know participating in in the mainstream pride events as uh, migrant communities you know it can be good for visibility it can be good for um, showing that you know there is some organizing within people that are that are not white um, and not belonging to certain circles that have easy access to all these resources. At the same time, not so much about the, the initiati initiatives um, themselves, but the way how they were framed uh, in the media, that was more um, problematic for me than, the, than, the, than their participation in the mainstream pride. Um, it was framed as an exception, as, you know, once again, a premiere, while different, you know, initiatives came before and they were different versions of this Orientalist idea of the other also being part of the gay community. Um, but the way how it was framed, I think that that bothered me a lot. Like this whole erasure of, of one's history is... Uh, is part of that, you know, discourse that we are talking about. Um, you tend to forget, at least in the media or in the public discourses, you tend to forget all these people that went before you, that we actually don't yeah. um, acknowledge, that we don't remember. Uh, we kind of pretend like we do, um, start all over again. 
Um, even some initiatives that were critical of the Pride, like um, a, a project or a group called Reclaim Our Pride, I also criticized that because uh, for me it's not enough that somebody is against mainstreaming the pride, against um, commercializing pride, against the capitalist neoliberal notions of the pride. I think it's much more interesting to look at how self-organizing can be so um, autonomous that, like we saw it in Hakim's movie, the people themselves can decide how they want to do it, that they decide the terms um, uh, on which they um, they express themselves. Um, but I think we we went a little bit too far with certain symbolics, with certain associations, um, using um, pride. Um, you know, even going back to the pride as an idea that was um, that um, as it was uh, um, beginning with a stone wall. I don't think that nowadays we can escape those frames that we are dealing with. Um, and there are certain associations. So I, I wouldn't, uh, once again, I wouldn't criticize it uh, too much for um, for what it was from the communities, but more as it is still framed uh, by the media. And I love the fact that we, we talk about different perspectives. I, I, I recognize some of the things that David, uh, David was talking about. Um, from the Balkans, because I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I see those frames come popping up all over again. You know, like the um, the way how, and I think I suppose that's uh, similar in 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 Hungary, how nationalist uh, right wing organizations are claiming it to be the part of their identity, national identity, to to be heterosexual that has to be embedded in your tradition. Um, but it's also interesting how some of the those self organizations are also claiming um, their prides, for example, or their aspiration for gay, uh, you know the, the LGBT emancipation as a way of going to Europe. So I hear a lot of activists from Bal Balkan claiming that by doing gay activism, for example, they are showing how they are part of Europe. Um, also, um, uh, a little bit of um, of a struggle within Balkan context is when I'm at, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course, I'm always critical of the local traditional nationalist ethno-religious voices as well. But I'm also critical of how the United States or Brussels are framing the um, gay emancipation in these countries as a kind of litmus test, as a as a proof that somebody is closer to us in Brussels than they were. And of course, different di dynamics are, are, are uh, in coming into play when you talk about Bosnia and Kosovo and Albania as obviously Muslim majority countries than, for example, in Croatia and Serbia. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, which came in for uh, David. I will read it out loud. Um, are the, uh, are there any homo nationalist parties that are in the opposition in Hungary? And then the second question: Are there opposition sides being nationalist and also air quotes gay friendly? Um, both of you, uh, David. Yes. Um, yeah. So homo nationalist parties that are in the opposition. Um, there, there is one nationalistic party. Um, that is in the so-called opposition, but in uh, most of uh, their policies, um, they are rather supportive to the uh, government, and they are actually more um, to the far right uh, political angle than uh, the government themselves. So uh, one example, so to that question, uh, the reason would be um, no, uh, or according to my judgment, no. Just to highlight how this far right nationalist party uh, operates a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, um, a children's book was published with uh, fairy tales that included characters that were marginalized, including Roma, including people living with disability and LGBT people. And one representative, actually an, ME, an MP of um, this opposition um, uh, party, tore down um, the books of this paper um, in a public um, um, press event and put them in a shredder 
So uh, basically saying that this is so dangerous to our uh, Hungarian uh, values that uh, this needs to be destroyed and shredded. This, I mean, this sparked a lot of outrage in the Hungarian society, not in the governing party, uh, obviously, but this is the nationalist uh, party. And as for the uh, opposition, um, I, I don't see any um, nationalist and gay friendly um, uh, party um, in, in the parliament or, or outside of the parliament. There, there are um, parties that are um, to some extent gay friendly. Um, some politicians, they do go to uh, pride marches, but uh, this is also development of, uh, of, of, of recent years. But I, I, I wouldn't say that they have a consistent uh, pro-LGBTQ political uh, program. I mean, if you, if you say that whether there, there are um, there are patterns of political parties trying to gain um, uh, political supporters through supporting the LGBTQ um, community. Um, I would say there are um, some signs of that, but because the LGBTQ issue is so unpopular in Hungary, um, it is not really an issue with which you can really spark a lot of political support in the uh, in the majority of the uh, of the society. So, uh, if you ask um, the Hungarian society in a, in a representative survey, and there were uh, examples for that, whether they personally know someone who is out and pride in their families on, or among their um, their um, um, their circles of friends or people that they uh, know, depending on the survey, you would uh, receive an answer between nine. And 14 percent. So that that's the share of the Hungarian society that personally knows um, a member of the LGBTQ community, which which means that it is uh, it is uh, very low. I mean, uh, I don't want to uh, say it as a joke, but uh, as you saw from recent developments in uh, in Brussels, coming out has been a, 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 an issue even for uh, leading politicians uh, who have. A lot of power and um, and the system of support uh, for them to to come out and um, have not been able to do so. So I mean, this this is a very serious story, obviously, but um, it's just ha just to highlight how serious the problem is. So my point is, I think to uh, to be able to um, to have a homo nationalistic agenda uh, as a political party. Uh, there should at least be some support for the LGBTQ issue or the LGBTQ committee in the society that you operate, and this is not yet uh, present in Hungary. And I guess this would be similar to um, Serbia, Croatia, or, or Bosnia-Herzegovina, but Dino probably has more experience on that. Would you reflect on, reflect on that, Dino? No, I think David said a lot. I think that um, you know the only thing that we have to you know rethink when we talk about homo nationalism is that obviously that term is also challenging us to think through um, you know nationalist I ideologies. But there are so many things at at stake. You know, um, I think we for tend to forget how. Um, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and racism are interconnected with the questions of gender and sexuality. So some of the people are saying like um, homo nationalism, uh, a bigger term or broader term is sexual nationalism, where gender comes into play. And I think, but David might disagree with me, but I think I hear a lot of um, uh, politicians or some of the public uh, discussions um, in Eastern Europe. I'm also confused when Hungary is Eastern Europe, but that's obviously that post-socialist framing of of um, of these countries. Um, um, you know, when they when they speak about migrants and Romas um, as the threat for their community, for our national identity, they are going to rape our women, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think in that in on that level, we can compare homo nationalism and sexual nationalism as being very present in those countries that see themselves as uh, the protectors. I mean, Viktor Orban is obviously seeing himself as a protector of Europe, um, you know, being a barrier of, of these barbarians coming into Europe. He's proud of his anti-immigrant policies, the walls that he set up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is a rhetoric that we see also in the, in the Balkans and even more uh, Southern. So I think you know, when you look at um, only at the LGBT rights, you might see a lot of differences because, you know, homophobia is um, a nationalist treasure of many countries um, that we are talking about. But at the same time, if you, for example, talk about how our women are being threatened by 
uh, immigrants, Muslims, Romas, then you hear all these uh, nationalist um, rhetorics uh, extremely loud and clear. Yeah, uh, so Hakim, um, we've been talking for um, the past 45 minutes about homonationalism uh, related to your film, but um, when you started the film project, did you actually have in mind that the film, um, besides being a great film, would also have like this more political kind of dimension? And um, I think my question is, do you think that art in general and film in specific can also play a role in politics? Oh, I think they obviously do because they they I think they can change change people's minds and opinions and minds and opinions express are expressed in the polls. So I think that they, there's a direct connection to to, to politics. Um, when we started the movie, we didn't know that we would um, talk in the documentary as much about uh, homonationalism or intersectionality. Um, it was brought up mm -hmm. by the people that we follow in the movie because they are also uh, political science students. And so they are learning these concepts and they are also living them every day. So um, this is also something that we loved about them is that sometimes they would mess up in terms of what concept they were talking about. There's this scene in the documentary where um, Youssef is talking about uh, homo-nationalism and Yanis is like, no, uh, this is pinkwashing. And the other one is like, no, pinkwashing is more like Tel Aviv. And he's like, no. And I, actually the conversation followed for like 10 minutes because it was so fresh for them. Um, and since they're 20, they're activists, they, wanted a little bit you know to show up in front of us and in front of show off sorry in front of the camera and pretend that they were really um aware and that they knew deep deeply well those concepts um and actually at some point we were scared of having all of these concepts in the movie because we thought we don't want the movie to be um accessible only for people who are already aware of all of this mm -hmm. we really wanted to also show it to people who are not in this um, in this area in this world, to to we wanted, yeah, we wanted actually everyone to be able to, to see it and to understand things and to be engaged with this um, young population. Um, but then we kept it because that's who they are. That's mm -hmm. how they speak. That's what they believe in. And this is also how they perceive the world. They really perceive. And at some point, Youssef says it. He says. Um, Everything is political with me. Even sex is political with me. So um, that's how they are. That's how they, they, they live. And yeah, honestly, we didn't think that this, um, all of these concepts would actually walk us through the movie. Um, we tried to find a balance between the concepts and also a more um, like some sort of character-driven documentary where um, there's one character almost, who's, uh, it's not a character because it's a real person, but Youssef is really the one who um, drives us through the documentary because, um, and actually I must say that um, Youssef now identifies as a transgender woman, but when we filmed, Youssef identified as um, a gay young man. Um, and Youssef was actually the one that encapsulated the whole march um, like in in their own life and story, because this whole march was for people who came from other countries who are perceived as um, Muslim migrants who live in the suburbs, who um, don't have a really big income, and who try to live the life, and they try to combine. Um, two things that are in themselves, which are being Muslim and being queer. And Youssef says that also the, the danger of homonationalism is that it tells people that they cannot be queer and Muslim at the same time, that it's impossible, that you have to choose. Either you're queer and then you have to forget your past life. You have to forget your parents, your religion, your beliefs, your, you forget about it. Or you stay in the religion and then 
if you try to fight who you really are, you know, somehow. And in, in the film, he's like, no, I'm both and I will be both forever. And I don't care if people don't agree, this is who I am. And I think that the danger, the danger of these politicians who try to um, show the migrant communities as uh, homophobic is that they, they don't just actually uh, put people against each other, but they also create uh, drifts within some people who are actually mm, migrant and queer at the same time. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really uh, insightful. Um, there's another question, um, and it's not addressed to someone in, um, in specific. So I will read it out loud, and whoever feels um, comfortable can answer the question. Um, what can we say to people who are saying we are glamorizing anti-gay violence slash hate within our communities? Is there someone who feels like... I suppose uh, this person, I mean, according to the name, I, I'm su supposing that that person is talking about migrant slash Muslim slash whatever community. So if that person is still out there, please just clarify a little bit. Okay, we, please rephrase, re rephrase the question. I will continue to the next question. Do you think the strategies like homo nationalism or even mainstream LGBT plus struggle in Europe monopolize queer struggles, history and identities? And then following up by constructing a purely Western history and image of the queer struggle. I think that would be a question for Dino. Yeah, I mean, the rest can also answer it. But I think this is completely what it's at stake at, uh, with, with this kind of discourses. As I said, there is an extreme erasure of people of color, queer people of color, activists that are almost as active as as the the whole movement uh, but luckily we have more and more um evidences and documents that uh, for example people that identified as queer muslims were there from the beginning like literally from the beginning of 20th century with the first gay organizing in 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 germany um so you know the thing is that we, and we also often tend to look at it through, you know, Germany happened, Stonewall happened, West European and the Northern American context happened. That's the uh, beacon of the, of the gay emancipation. So I think um, we have to turn those narratives and to show how these narratives are, are extremely, extremely dangerous narratives that we inherited from the colonial times. Um, and are still we are still struggling with that because queerness, um, uh, either if it's all about gender or sexuality, existed in all societies, and in particular in society in Muslim societies across the world, there is a great history of people gen of gender non-conforming people and people that are not fitting into heteronormative narratives. Uh, but somehow we tend to erase that, ignore that, even their own sources. I'm, I'm talking about Oriental. Uh, orientalist writings about the the muslim east they even tend to ign ignore their own resources or sources that are talking about this extremely sexually over sexualized muslim uh, east and some somehow we became the puritans and anti-gay so you know the west has to has to figure out what they really think about um uh, the, especially the muslim other Hakim or David, you want to reflect on this question? Yeah, just, uh, uh, no, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just, yeah, wanted to reflect on, on what Dino just said, uh, because this is also something that um, Youssef, again, really believes in, in the, in the documentary, is that um, in the countries, um, in, for instance, in the Arabic world, they were they were queer communities that were existing and that were somehow also really accepted and cele celebrated. And through colonization, these communities um, were shut down. And so now these countries are perceived um, as homophobic 
but without really going back in history and trying to understand what happened actually in those countries. And so we are now uh, inheriting somehow some sort of history that we don't really make the effort to, to, to understand. And personally, um, I was born in Algeria and I grew up there in the 90s. And you had, um, um, I didn't really see a lot of um, gay men or lesbian women, but I saw a lot of um, transgender people. And people would not talk about it a lot, but neighbors would know, families would know, and people would accept it. It was not like official and out and loud, but people were like discreetly saying, yeah, I know, but you know, that's my neighbor and it's all good. So there's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really weird how it's perceived here and how it's perceived like on the other side of the, of the sea. <laughs> So two, two uh, very brief points, if I may. Uh, can I add that, Chris? Sure. Yeah, so uh, so one point on on Hungary's Roma population that is around five or six percent of the uh, of the entire population. That's an, that's a, that's an ethnic minority um, in Hungary, and um, I think um, and I'm not uh, here to speak on behalf of the uh, Roma queer community in, in Hungary, obviously, but uh, these are just my uh, observations. Um, I, I think if we want to capture uh, some patterns of homonationalism in Hungary, that's that's even within the mainstream um, LGBTQ community against the Roma members of the community in the form of uh, try of tr kind of trying to portray um, Roma people as a threat to the um, to the mainstream non-Roma um, community. Um, and, and that's that's a huge issue. So so anti-Roma sentiments and racism within the LGBTQ community in, in Hungary, I think that is that is something that that could be captured. And uh, and one sign is that um, that it took um, took um, nine years for um, for um, for the biggest um, uh, queer paper, the queer magazine in, in Hungary, to feature. Uh, Roma queer people um, in an article, and this happened only very recently, uh, which I think is a welcome step, um, but which took a long time um, uh, to get there. This is this is one point, um, and uh, and another one I would like to make is um, is Viktor Orbán's uh, fight with the European institutions um, and. Um, and this, this, which comes very visible into most of the countries that we uh, come from in Europe, in form of uh, the rule of law debate and other debates between the government of Hungary and oftentimes the Polish government uh, towards institutions in the European Union as well. And unfortunately, it seems increasingly to, to me that the LGBT communities of these countries are actually um, um, victims of this fight because the anti LGBTQ sentiments could be used. Uh, in the narrations to fuel the own um, Hungarian, pop uh, Polish, or whichever population in the fight against the EU institutions. And I think EU institutions themselves um, are failing very much to respond mm. to this. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the Hungarian society itself is, is ready to respond well to this, but, um, but this is just an observation and a phenomena that I think um, we have to be in mind. Thank you very much. It wasn't a short comment, though. Um, <laughs> but thanks a lot. Um, another question came in, and I'm afraid that will be the final question. Um, and I look to my colleague. Yeah, I think this is the final question, unless another question will come in soon. And uh, yeah, and it also depends on the duration of your answer. But I will read it out loud. Could the false exploitation of homo nationalism on a long term? have a positive effect on the acceptance of homosexuals between brackets because it starts off from the feeling that homosexuality is okay. And then the same person actually has an additional question and ultimately maybe even have a positive effect on homosexual migrants as a side effect. Who wants to start? Yeah, I mean, this is this is an interesting, and I think 
this might look as one of the side effects, but it's not. It's it's taking too long to have these side effects. We also see, you know, like 40 years of, let's say, homonationalist discourses in the Netherlands didn't really help the, the um, queer migrant communities to, to win their uh, uh, place at the at, uh, you know those big tables that we are talking about the major issue with with the acceptance of homosexuality is the conditionality of the of that acceptance so when jasbir poar who coined the term homonationalism uh, homo uh, she stretches the argument of um, homonormativity which represent the neoliberal sexual politics so that means that only certain parts or certain people that call themselves homosexuals are accepted. Um, so there is not all queer people are accepted in homo nationalist discourses. The ones that subscribe to the nationalist ideologies, they are more than welcome. The others that are critical, that are talking about racism, Islamophobia, about multiple discrimination, as we saw in Hakim's video, they are ultimately still the other, maybe less dangerous, but still the one that can be problematic, the potential of being the, the problematic one. Do you have anything to add, Hakim? Or do you have a different um, Just, yeah, a, a quick thing is that even now, I think that what we see with homo-nationalism is that it only um, seems to accept just one part of the LGBTQ um, community is that it's most of the time, the white gay men. And um, if you try to ask the same people um, about transgender people, well, they will be way more at ease to, for instance, defend them and to try to protect them against the threat of migrants. So even, yeah, I'm just reflecting about what Dino just said now, there's the, the good um, people who are allowed to be, um, uh, gay and themselves and to be uh, protected by politicians and those who we don't really care. And that's a lot of people in this LGBTQ community. And David? No comments? Um, no, I, I already took a lot of space. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, Kim, for um, allowing us to screen your film. It was a pleasure to have you thank here you also, um, you so in much. our midst. And Dino and David, uh, well, thanks so much for your um, remarks and comments and, um, and also for the work uh, you're doing. Um, having said that, I would like to point out that there's three more online talks to come. So tomorrow there is a talk on um, new queer initiatives in Amsterdam. There will be three um, queer organizations and um, initiatives who will introduce themselves. On Saturday, there is an artist's talk with a Turkish filmmaker, uh, Metin Agdemir and Simona von Sarlos, which will uh, uh, eventually end in a Zoom party with DJs from Amsterdam and Istanbul. And on um, Sunday, there's a concluding talk on um, and there was already an introduction today by Dino and David actually, but it's on um, Central and Eastern Europe. And we will discuss two films from um, one, one from Georgia and one from uh, Chechnya. So um, thank you all. Also um, people who watched from home, thank you so much for um, being participant in this um, fruitful conversation. Personally, I enjoyed it very much and I hope you did too. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye.